Welcome to Art Mirrors Futures. Today I'd like to talk about the, perhaps one of the most famous paintings in art history, the famous Arnolfini portrait. So it's an exciting story, but at the same time, because I want to share so much stuff, uh, it's also a very complex story. I don't know how we'll manage, but let's, let's see. Um, in a way, introduction is very simple and also very difficult. Because it is one of the most famous works, I can skip almost everything. Uh, there are, even here on YouTube, there are plenty of movies you could just search and find, you know, dozens of the previous uh, stories about Arnolfini and about Jan van Eyck, who made this uh, painting, who created this painting. Lots of interesting theories, interpretation, and so on. Indeed, there's a painting known as Portrait of uh, Arnolfini and his wife, although that's widely debated <laughs> exactly what we see here. Is it is it a marriage? Is it pre-marriage of the Throchel, or is it already post-mortem pro uh, portrait, and so on? There are endless uh, amount of interpretations, uh, which is again I can skip <laughs> for this purpose of this uh, of this particular blog. Uh, my interest to this artwork is almost self-evident. It is perhaps one of the most famous um, mirrors in art, almost epitome of um, depiction of mirrors in art. The famous mirror of Arnolfini. It's a central uh, piece of the of the painting. It is uh, also kind of considered to be one of its gems, uh, unique, uh, very original for the time, and how uh, uh, Van Eyck was playing very uh, um, creatively with the sort of placing this mirror in the middle of the painting that allowed him to kind of also depict the the people on a, that are not present in the painting, but somehow maybe entering the room. It is considered to be originally from artistic point of view. Uh, other people argue that it's also very um, symbolical and sort of uh, indicative for the whole time being. For example, Michel Foucault writes about how this kind of placement of people in the painting, um, including, for example, placing the viewer in the painting. So technically speaking, you have to, if it will be real uh, mirror, you would see yourself in this painting. Uh, already present. So that was, according to Foucault, a very indicative for modernity, kind of uh, reflecting the the growing attention of the painter to the potential viewer of his, of his work. And of course, then it was uh, lately um, manifested in the work of um, Velasquez, for example. So the mirror of Arnolfini is perhaps as famous as the painting itself. Um, you could type mirror of Arnolfini, you will find hundreds of thousands of hits and links no one, no single publication questioned the fact that's a mirror, right? Now, what if, what if I uh, show you that that's not a mirror? Arnafi mirror is not a mirror. It is something else. Let me try to tell you the story. Why and in what sense I can say that Arnafi mirror is not a mirror? Uh, well, first of all, kind of maybe a few explanations. Um, in what sense I can say that that's a mirror? It's not a mirror. Um, you could see here um, one of many, many uh, reinterpretation or homages to Arnolfini. It's one of the most uh, reinterpreted or sort of appropriated work of uh, art as well. It's actually not a bad one. It's relatively witty. First of all, it's recognizable Arnolfini. The composition of the of this illustration or of this picture is clearly resemble Arnolfini. Uh, we see entirely different context. It's very contemporary. We see a couple of teenagers caught by one of the parents, I think it's her parents, and uh, the teenager's caught. It looks very, very innocent, similar to Arnolfini, but there are some hints and traces. <laughs> we see that, again, very interestingly, because there are also hints, apparently, in Arnolfini painting, Arnolfini portrait, and this kind of a reinterpretation plays very nicely with this. Um, we see, for example, the pregnancy kit <laughs> on a desk, kind of hinting, again, one of the ma you know, ma major enigma of Arnolfini, is this lady pregnant or not, and so on. So that's a kind of interesting hinting. Now let's have a look at the mirror of this painting. That's clearly a mirror. I would not question at all. That's typical contemporary mirror. Um, it is doing the same job as a, in a portrait of Arnolfini. It's depicting the parents entering the room, but it's also um, in, in many ways recognizable. We use mirrors for uh, this purpose, for example, placing our postcards, or photography, and so on. So that's mirror without any questions. So I made a very brutal Photoshop event, um, effort. Um, I replaced this uh, desk or mirror and laptop with this um, monitor, 
or a display. So basically, optically speaking, that's the same. It's not impossible to imagine this kind of display reflecting the entering parents, um, the parents entering the room. However, even when we see this pain, uh, painting or this picture, we would never call this object a mirror. We would clearly say that's a display or a monitor that also reflect, uh, has a reflect, reflective capacity and therefore it reflects um, uh, this group of parents entering the room. Um, and so in, it is in this way I would consider Arnolfini mirror as not a mirror. So basically, if I go back to this Arnolfini, there's something there that we call mirror, but it's not. It was made for different purposes. It was used for different purposes by these people. It just resembled mirrors. It has this mirror capacity, but itself functionally and for, for, the, for its purpose it was in the mirror. And that's basically the whole story. To make my point, or to sort of present my point, I will be showing you a lot of um, artworks uh, from this period of time and from this place. The period of time is roughly 15th century, sort of maybe very beginning of the 16th century. And the place, it's, this was um, roughly corresponding to contemporary Belgium or Flanders, but back then it was called Duchy of Bur Burgundy. Basically from now on, I'll show you a, a whole assortment of, of paintings all from this time, all from this place, by different authors, different masters, um, in some way, or showing or depicting objects that look like Arnolfini mirror. Perhaps the most famous is this um, um, triptych called Feral Triptych by Robert Campin. He was a contemporary of Jan van Eyck, he was a bit younger than him, and this particular triptych was painted really four years after Arnolfini. Um, in 19, sorry, in 1438. Um, it is strikingly familiar, it's strikingly similar to um, the depiction of uh, Arnolfini portrait. We see the same kind of mirror, uh, although its frame is much more simple, but we see also kind of people entering the room or being outside of the, we don't see them on a the fairground. This, you see now the fragment of this picture, the full picture, in fact, like that. Uh, it's two panels. Uh, right now they're in Madrid. We believe now that there used to be a, a side wings of one triptych, so in reality it should look like that. Uh, so it's a two side panel of one triptych, and we're missing the central part. Interestingly enough, and I'll, I'll try to explain later on, that depending on what would be de depicted on the central part, uh, I could call these things mirror or not. It's maybe difficult to understand, but I'll try to explain later on. But right now we assume that's a mirror. It's basically um, hanging in a sort of a left panel in a settings where strikingly different, of course, from uh, Arnolfini. But the kind of comparison this this mirror is uh, was spotted very early. There are lots of works comparing this to mirrors, because that kind of similarity of composition. It's not quite clear still whether, for example, Robert Campin you know, appropri appropriated uh, the trick used by Van Eyck, what basically copyright infringement, or was it seen as a, a legitimate homage or appropriation, which is everybody will see as a kind of a bow to the master, admiration of his, of his um, work. We still don't know that. Um, Striking difference between these two paintings, the left is it's just a portrait, the right one is a religious painting, it's a part, part of altarpiece. In fact, what we see here is uh, John the Baptist hung, uh, holding the lamp of the God, which is symbol of Christ. So it's completely different, and it looks like a church, uh, this, uh, this, this place. And then the question is what exactly this mirror would be doing in a church, or maybe a chapelle or something. Uh, it's itself very, very interesting. That's why, therefore, I say the meaning of this, uh, the exact meaning and the name of this object will depends on what what is this um, the triptych was about. But nevertheless, these two mirrors uh, attracted attention by of many researchers. This is a, a picture from the research done by I think Microsoft Research already like some fifteen years ago. They compared the uh, reflection in these mirrors. Um, they treated them just simply as a convex mirrors, and they compared the two um, surfaces. On the left side, you see kind of 
um, distorted surfaces. Again, technologically speaking, that kind of mirrors people were make, able to make back then. They were not able to make flat mirrors yet. But in, uh, kind of from digitally, you could reconstruct what if these mirrors will be uh, flat. So what kind of uh, um, reflection they would depict. And then they compare that and see that how much um, distorted was a the image created by the painters and then of course in both cases it was proven that that the level of distortion is pretty uh, consistent so it's not possible to do it just out of your head so you have to have certain kind of uh, you know real object something of this of the size and then paint it from real life therefore your reflections or your distortion kind of uh, um, are made more in a more consistent way so I was um, in a way triggered or inspired by this example of this research and I thought maybe to look for um, other examples of other works, artworks, although I have to be very careful here, it's maybe not artworks for those people, it's religious work, altarpieces and panels, devotional objects that in many, in some way or another maybe depicting the object similar to Arnolfini thing. So I found quite a few. I can show you just a few examples. Um, this is, for example, um, a panel by, maybe not necessarily by Roger van der Weyden himself. Uh, it's a famous painter, maybe com comparable to Jan van Eyck. They lived in the same time and place. I think uh, Roger van der Weyden also lived in Brugge. But it's perhaps one of his pupils or the work of his uh, workshop. So we see here the scene of Annunciation. Um, one of the most revered in Christianity, when uh, Gabrielle announced Mary that she would um, carry the Son of God. Um, in this tradition in Flemish school, they often depicting it in happening in the bedroom of Mary. That's why we see this bedroom and her bed, and of course this interesting object in um, uh, in her head bed, looking like a um, convex mirror. There's another example, it's a, a painting by Jos van Kleve, another Flemish master, a bit later, already see beginning of 16th century. Uh, we see roughly the same, much more elaborate uh, room of Mary, with um, many more objects, for example, her uh, other altarpiece. But what is interesting, in her bedroom we see a similar object. It's another um, sort of kind of convex mirror. In fact, if you look closer, it's even reflect the pillow beneath. And then the last one uh, in this series is um, the panel by Jan de Beer, the master from Antwerp, um, belonging to the school which was, we now describe Antwerp Manierism or Northern Manierism. So you see it's much more you know, beautified and sort of a little bit more kind of almost unbelievably beautiful compared to the previous two. Well, we also see the thing which is uh, look like a convex mirror. It, in this case it hangs uh, next to the, the bed. So all these three are interesting, but at the same time they look like confirmation. There was something of this sort in the bedrooms of, of the people back then. At the same time, and if you know the uh, history of uh, Christianity, all of them have a sort of relatively simple explanation. Uh, I didn't know it myself, I discovered by by exploring these things, but apparently the mirror uh, at some point became a symbol of Mary, although I have to be more here, it's a symbol, it's attribute of Mary, among other things such as rose or well or moon and so on. Uh, and also with this very, very uh, typical description, speculum sine macula, so it's a mirror without defect, uh, I think literally called stainless mirror, spotless mirror. Of course, uh, referring to her purity and cleanness and sort of uh, sinliness and so on. So in this particular case, it's a panel I found in Lisbon, but it's uh, attributed to Flemish uh, master, which is very, very um, recognizably Flemish school in this painting. So we see Virgin and the child and patrons and films uh, saints, and this object on the uh, left side left uh, wall with a clearly explicit description speculum sine macula. This type of uh, kind of co combination of depiction of Virgin or Madonna or Mary with mirrors is not unique. We see many of those. I will show you just two, two most famous examples. One is a diptych by Hans Memling, uh, so-called uh, Neuenhove diptych. Uh, when we see on one panel the Mary and the child, and another one is a patron, Martin van Neuthove, 
And then uh, on this panel with uh, Mary, we see a mirror hanging in a window beneath, behind her. Another example is a, pairing, is a painting by Derek Bagert. Uh, technically speaking, he was a German master here from Münster. But uh, he was trained in Bruges, uh, I think, and this particular panel was uh, really a copy of the famous uh, altarpiece by Roger van der Weyden, uh, which is not preserved till now, but this is almost like accurate, uh, identical replica of this thing. So we can see this almost a work of uh, van der Weyden himself. That's, um, again, a piece of, uh, part of altarpiece. I think it's a central panel. It depicts uh, Luke painting uh, Virgin and the child. And in the window we see this uh, mirror, which is uh, very nicely placed in the right place where the mirrors should be. It's actually the best location for the mirror to, to hang. You could see uh, yourself very well, and mirror is in the shadow. Your reflection uh, is just perfect. At the same time, so in both this and the previous diptych, it is functionally uh, a mirror, and at the same time kind of symbolically a mirror of, uh, of uh, attribute of, of uh, Madonna. Um, this next painting is very interesting. I think in many ways it was a pivotal for sort of my exploration. Uh, you could see here it's a panel by the same Jan de Beer I was talking before. Uh, typically for his for this uh, school of uh, Antwerp manierism, it's very uh, beautified. We see uh, very detailed sort of luxurious and lavish uh, depiction. The scene itself is actually the birth of Virgin, so the the young infant, the young baby. Uh, we see on the left side it's actually Mary, and the, the woman, um, the woman and in the bed, it's uh, Saint Anna. You see many, many interesting details, and uh, almost like the, the paradise for anthropologists uh, to understand what's going on in the, in this moment of time and space um, during the delivery, for example. But I'm, I'm after mirrors, and what we see, of course, on the left side of this painting, on a sort of uh, Mary side. This is Mary um, being warmed up near a fireplace. But in the window we see mirror, a very interesting frame, octagonal, uh, eight sides, and then um, it actually we can even spot some reflection of this uh, maid with, with Mary. But it, it, as before, we can see it as a both functional mirror placed very um, conveniently in this in this location. At the same time, we can see it as a attribute of Mary. However. What exactly we see on the right uh, place, and that was very interesting departure from my research. We see very interesting objects. I have never read any particular description of that. What it is, um, neither in museum nor in um, sort of books about this uh, master. So it looks like a medallion of some sort, very elaborate, very complex design. There's a kind of in the middle. There's something like a maybe small mirror or the the, the big bead, and it's placed. Um, in the headbed of, of St. Anna. Um, what it is, you could always see uh, as an exceptionally strange painting. Like I was lucky because soon after that I found another painting which is very, very similar scene. In this case, it's, uh, it's already a painter from Amsterdam, Jakob Cornelius van Ostonsen, um, regarded as a first Amsterdam painter. Um, so the painting itself actually um, pretty large. I think it's as tall as two meters. Um, we think it was a part of a altar piece, uh, which is the only piece survived, and it depicts the scene of uh, the same the same scene of um, um, the birth of, of uh, Mary, uh, with this roughly the same composition. It's much more detailed than the one by uh, Jan de Beer. Uh, on the left side, we see the Mary being again at the fireplace and of course appropriately we see the painting so we see the mirror in a window quite impressive very large also was very sort of luxurious um, frame um, however on the right side similar to the, the painting by Jan de Beer we see um, the Saint, Saint Anna laying in her bed and then kind of strange object above her which in this case really resemble uh, convex mirrors, it's just yet another convex mirror. So what's going on? Is it a second uh, convex mirror or what's the purpose of that? It's functionally not even um, very sort of easy to use. You have to stand in the bed to use it in, in any sort of conventional way. 
So basically after this examples, I continue my searches and I find a few more of those. Um, what you see here is another panel uh, with a similar motif of um, the woman just gave birth to the child and she's still laying in bed and then the child is in the hands of the maid. However, this painting, despite the similarity to the, the previous ones, it depicts a very different uh, personas. In this case we see the birth of John the Baptist, and the lady who is laying in the bed is Saint Elizabeth. We see yet another convex thing, right? So it looks like something looks like convex mirror. Again, very, very um, elaborate, uh, with a very obviously showing the sort of uh, reflection. That's another interesting panel. That's a um, painting by Bernard van Arley from Brussels, and in this case it again depicts uh, the scene of um, the birth of John the Baptist. In this case, it's more complex composition. We see both his birth and actually his death, his execution in the left corner. Uh, again, typical device for the, the master of this time to kind of combine a few moments in, in life. Um, but again, I'm interested in um, the object hanging above the Saint Elizabeth, and again, we see the beautiful, um, interesting. I would still call it mirror, but or increasingly an object, really, really uh, intricate design of the frame. Um, not only the mirror, but also kind of very complex uh, frame. That's a very interesting painting. In, in many, many ways, it was a turning point for my story. Um, maybe I, I didn't introduce myself in this introductory movie. Uh, it's actually a privilege to live uh, in the place. I live in the Netherlands, in the south of the Netherlands, right in the place where many of these things were happening. I mean, the the, the work of the painters, uh, the, the Van Eyck and the Vaden and uh, Van Arley and so on and so on. So very often you have a chance to see this painting still in their natural habitat. This is how it happened actually with this particular one. First I found this panel in the internet. You could see here it's again the scene of Annunciation. Um, slightly differently composed, but in a way similar. It's kind of happening in a, in a house of Mary and we see the bedroom kind of on the background. We see the bed. And that's exactly where I spotted some kind of strange object. I thought it's a mirror. First of all, I thought it's a kind of yet another mirror hanging in the, in his bed. So, but because the quality was so bad, I thought I was, didn't have any chance to, um, to say it with any certainty. To my surprise, I discovered this painting is still actually in the active church, or at least this, this older piece. So, um, near Dortmund uh, in Germany. So it's a small village called Schermbeck, uh, and the church is St. George Kirche, the church of St. George. So I had a chance to go there um, just on one of my trips. So I wrote the pastor and he was very kind uh, to show me the church to open and in fact open this altarpiece, which is I think it's not fully in line with sort of strict religious uh, procedures. Because as you see here, it's a quite a large altarpiece. Still it's really in church in working as altarpiece. So in fact you have to open and close it. And this particular panel is in the outer side, so you wouldn't see it if the altarpiece is open which is often the case. Uh, you have to close all the pieces, then you will see this particular the panel of the Annunciation. But he was very kind. He opened this and then he let me take pictures. So you see somehow a slightly better version of this, um, of this panel. And obviously this better picture allows me to see that it's not a mirror at all. It's a kind of medallion um, hanging in a bedroom, of, or actually in a headbed of Mary's bed. Had a, we had a chance to discuss, and he admitted that he didn't. He doesn't know. He didn't know what the name of this things, how it is called. In fact, there was a research. He showed me the book, and in this book, it is described in very, very abstract ways, like a plate, or basically even not a medallion. There's no name. He didn't know the name. He didn't know how these people would came, would call these things uh, at that time. So actually, I'm still struggling how to um, how to describe this uh, kind of devotional medallion or something. But then, triggered by that, the sort of I thought, oh, I've, I've seen many of those in, during my searches for in my, my searches for mirrors. Perhaps one of the most famous is actually the panel of Annunciation by Roger van der Weyden, when we see just straight in the, the bedroom, uh, straight in the bed of Mary, this medallion likely depicting God the Father. And that's another uh, panel by 
unknown master is described as a master of uh, Sopretran, um, which is Spanish city, Spanish monastery, but the master is obviously from Flanders. Uh, many Flemish masters were working or were commissioned by the um, Spanish patrons at this time. So that's uh, the painting, it's kind of classical Flemish uh, primitivism end of 15th century. We see again the same thing, the depiction of the Annunciation, and we see very strikingly this medallion in the bedroom, of, in the bed of, of Mary. Um, that's a, another example, in this case is Jan Provost. In this case we see interesting medallion. It's not depicting um, any figure, for example Jesus or the God the Father or something of the sort, but it, it's more abstract. It's almost like a jewelry. It's hanging in a place where sort of we've seen the mirrors before and this is the final piece I'd like to show uh, this is yet another piece perhaps the most elaborate piece I have found so far it is uh, the, the panel uh, by Peter Koke van Alst uh, another master from Antwerp um, it's again enunciation incredibly lavish so you can see this sort of a uh, beautified uh, dress of gowns or robe for, of, of Archangel um, and then, of course, in the um, bed head of, of Mary, we see this enormously complex design of this object. That's that's definitely not a mirror, but it's a kind of thingy. Such a intricate design, incredibly luxurious. I don't know. It's a masterpiece. I've, I've never seen anything comparable to that in any museum. The last piece I can show. It's a small panel by Jan Hay or Jean Hay. Uh, he was known as Master of Moulin. Uh, or Master of Mechelin, if, if you say it in the Flemish way. Again, Annunciation, very different style, but again, in the head, uh, in the bed head of, of Mary, we see um, the medallion with Jesus, like literally, it's a depiction of the small depiction of, uh, of Jesus. So, after showing you all the all these paintings, basically, my conclusion is the following all what you've seen so far is basically one and the same object. Whether it's very um, sort of representational depiction of Jesus or God the Father or any other sort of uh, realistic figures, or kind of those strangely elaborate medallion, or what we now call complex mirrors, including the the thing with uh, from the portrait of Arnolfini, it's fundamentally one and the same things. And because there's no name for that, I would call it an icon. So basically, the sort of my conclusions, what you see in the paintings of, uh, of Arnolfini is an icon. I'm placing the icon of from Russian Orthodox religion, it could be anything, but in the Western iconography and the Western history of art, the word icon is not used um, for this kind of paintings, um, but functionally it's exactly that. So when I say um, this so-called mirror of Arnolfini is like not a mirror but an icon, in a way, it's a kind of resolution of the enigma, but at the same time, it's the um, beginning of many more questions. How this was made, who was making this, and how it was installed, and so on. So many, many questions should be answered. In case of Arnolfini portrait, it's actually very, very um, interesting that it's almost self-evident from the beginning. I presented you with a lot of paintings and pictures and panels and so on. In principle, from the Arnolfini portrait alone itself, it could be quite obvious that it's not a mirror in, a, in a, our classical sense. Um, if you look at this very carefully at its frame, it is surrounded by the, the scenes of the Christ patient. Uh, not exactly <laughs> appropriate for any, any particular mirror. It's almost evidently to your face um, a manifestation of this. It's a very, very serious devotional object. In principle, you could imagine something of this sort. Um, so it's a it's a, an object like it will be that would be the Arnolfini mirror, kind of the portrait of Jesus and surrounded by his passion. That would be then therefore unmistakably um, an icon, a, a devotional object to pray and perhaps to use it as a guardian for your for your space, maybe even a healing device, as I would argue. But because of certain association of Christ with this sort of a omnipresent, omni-looking uh, God, um, the kind of the appearance of the mirrors, convex mirrors, was useful, uh, was interesting way to kind of incorporate them in this imagery. The metaphor is of course very famous, uh, the omni-seeing God. 
Um, it is this, this particular painting is from the famous panel by Bosch, Hieronymus uh, Bosch, uh, Seven Cardinal Scenes. And so, it, in this context, therefore, sort of the very look and feel of the early convex mirrors was perhaps considered to be uh, an interesting um, design solution for this icon. So, instead of doing this sort of fully representational picture of Jesus or the Lamb, any other attributes, they would use mirror, convex mirror as a religious object, incorporating it, making sure that it actually not unmistakably would be seen as, as, a, as a devotional object, for example, by decorating it by, with this, with this uh, scene of uh, passion. But it's, again, as we talk about specific practice, it's not only the object, it's also all the practices surrounding, for example, what is praying, what, is, what, you, what kind of rituals you have to do with this, ob this object. Therefore, we can also look for the hints in the very same painting um, for, for this sort of a uh, forgotten uh, practice. What you see here is a reconstruction and a very contemporary reconstruction. I think it's even digital reconstruction of the space, Arnolfini room, uh, without uh, Arnolfini and his wife. So we see kind of recognizable um, sort of uh, interior with a bed and there's all these benches and so on. And of course those things that people consider mirrors, which I argue not. But notice that how they depicted this bench underneath, beneath this mirror. Um, it is kind of seen as a bench to sit and maybe, you know, to have rest. Which is, wouldn't be correct if it will be a, an icon for prey. You would do it differently. I recently found kind of alternative reconstruction, much more simple. The person just made it kind of a, like a dollhouse made of arlofinium, much more sort of uh, playful. But he somehow spotted very, very accurately what these things will be. That's not a chair to seat. That it's a, it's a stool. It's a sort of a um, chair to pray. In a well, in principle, you could kneel and um, pray on on uh, on the floor. But for more, you know, for richer people, for people uh, who could afford this, uh, they would use this um, over this chair. To, to knee and then pray in front of this of this icon. So that's how it would be uh, seen. Another typical example is this um, other object that's hanging near uh, this so-called Arnolfini mirror, which is, I would suggest, of course, to call Arnolfini icon. Um, on the left side, on the right from the mirror, but left for us, it's a rosary. But on the right side, the, um, the, 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 there's an object that is almost universally called the broom or something, the brush. Um, and then there was a variety of associations, something like this shows, uh, you know, the, how tidy the, the house and how, you know, she's cleaning the house and all, all those other nonsenses. She wouldn't touch anything in this house. She would have five maidens help, helping her. Um, but in this particular case, it's also not a cleaning, uh, in this case, of brushing something or dusting, like a duster. Uh, next to that. It's obviously a very different meaning. Um, the call is, uh, the thing is called Aspergillum, I think, if I correctly <laughs> pronounce it. There's basically um, a device to sprinkle holy water. Before praying, you have to, every believer has to clean the space, uh, cleans the space from the possible evil spirits and basically prepare the, himself or herself uh, and the space for, for praying. Therefore, they use this particular device, and that's exactly what is hanging uh, next to this um, icon, this. And yet, somehow, universally, we kind of again, keep ignoring all the signals, we keep reinterpreting the reconstruction of the rooms is very, very striking example, how we basically bending the, the even the, the reality according to our contemporary ideas, our contemporary assumption about what it is. Uh, so that's my uh, attempt, this is my first story uh, for, this, for this blog. It's very complex and it took me and I already make lots of shortcuts here uh, to, when presenting it. For me, it was exercise, almost like uh, questioning your own assumptions. Uh, what exactly we see? Why are we projecting our beliefs? Are our projections correct? And what, what's the grounding? And in what sense we can challenge them? You see here that what I was trying to do is to go back from, um, or kind of suspend our assumptions and go back and look for um, examples of materiality, sort of the artifacts, but also not artifacts per se, but also related practices and how they integrate it in space, 
how they maybe interact with other uh, devices, for example, in this case it's an icon, but also furniture, for example, supporting these rituals. And if we see this and how this practice was unfolding and so on. If by any chance you have any information related to it, please share. So um, thank you, and then until the next story about art, mirrors, and futures. See you.